Hello and welcome to the BSME British Schools in the Middle East webinar series. My name is Aisha Khan and I'm the Professional Learning Coordinator here at BSME. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us for today's webinar, Transforming Change into Success, How to Navigate Digital Turbulence. The session is being recorded and is going to be available through our website afterwards on bsme.org.uk. Before we start, please may I direct your attention to the chat pod. This is the white box on the lower right hand corner of your screen. You'll notice that at the moment your microphones are muted, but if you do have any thoughts or questions or comments throughout the session, please do write them here and these will be answered at the end. To test that you can hear me, and so I know that the chat function is working as it should, can I please ask somebody to make a comment, say good morning, and perhaps let me know where you're listening in from. Once I get a comment or so, I'll know everything is working and we'll make a start. Hi there, thank you. I can see that that's working. Thanks for that confirmation. So today's webinar, Transforming Change into Success, How to Navigate Digital Turbulence, is delivered by Jonathan Cronin in partnership with Education Horizons and Engage. Jonathan has been an accomplished leader of ICT in schools for over 20 years, including the Assistant Head for E-Enhancement at the British School of Barcelona, which is a leading international British school in Spain. He does have a Master's in E-Inclusion from King's College in London, and was a fast track mentor for head teachers and a member of the King's College's initial teacher training committee. Prior to his 10 years in independent education, Jonathan taught for nine years in the British state school system, including the head of IT at an Ofsted outstanding school. Jonathan joined Education Horizons and Engage in 2016 after successfully implementing the Engage MIS in his previous role. Jonathan's particular area of expertise within Education Horizons is data flow within schools and making the most of your time management system. I do hope you find it useful. Jonathan, welcome and over to you now. Okay, thank you very much for the for the introduction and um, thank you for those watching that you've, uh, you've made the time to join me today at this Transforming Change into Success, How to Navigate um, Digital Turbulence. When turbulence is the new normal, um, a school's success depends on vigilant leadership that can anticipate threats, spot opportunities, and act quickly when the time is right. Now, before the coming of COVID-19, technological forces had already required schools to manage change and make decisions more quickly than ever before. However, the pandemic has intensified those needs never have schools of all sizes felt so much pressure to adapt their learning practices and introduce new technological solutions. During the session, we'll explore how schools can use agile management principles to ensure that the appropriate software solutions are purchased and are actually embedded into whole school procedures. Now, my presentation is going to be split into five, uh, five different sections. I will start exploring changes in society while at the same time giving a, a, brief, a brief background to myself, which basically helps to explain how I arrived at this topic. This will then be followed by the ways technology is traditionally dealt with in schools, how COVID then destroyed school life, um, what it means, what about what is meant by agile leadership and how it can be used in schools to cope with change. Now, I was a teacher at the, um, the chalkboard uh, and then the whiteboard and then the flipped classroom for roughly 20 years and um, old habits do die hard. So I begin with a simple start of activity uh, to break the ice and to give me a bit of <laughs> thinking time as well. Um, so this is probably one of my more favourite IT kind of dad jokes. Um, and like a lot of jokes, there's an actual hint of truth in it. And it helps to explain how computers in general work 
and why as humans we often fall foul of it. And that's because there's a mismatch, a mismatch between human expectations and the reality of technology. And one of those key misconceptions is that often people make the mistake that they think that technology is actually here to help them. Now, that's a nice idea to have, but actually technology is here to make you more efficient. Hopefully that helps you. But that's the overriding principle that they're there to make you more efficient. And we'll see why that's the case in a moment. Now, I started out myself in the computing world back in the early um, 1980s on what was a Spectrum 48K and buying a weekly soccer comic that was actually printed on paper, <laughs> not only the glossy paper that you might get now or the idea that actually you had to wait a week and actually walk to a shop to actually get uh, something to purchase news or information. And one of the reasons I bought it, apart from actually being very interested in soccer as a, as a young child, was that there was a page on computer programming. And computers had just entered the home, uh, which was actually much to the annoyance of my sister as I, I kept taking her tape recorder. And that's probably talking about a, a tape recorder is probably dating me as well. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the, the Spectrum, you had to load games via a tape cassette recorder. Then in the early 90s, uh, I went to university to complete an engineering degree. Uh, it was an electrical engineering, and it focused on information technology. And it, 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 this also would give you a bit of a background into the difference between information technology and computer science. Information technology in general came from an electrical engineering background whereas computer science tended to come from a mathematical background. Uh, to start off with, with computers, you had to load the, operate, the operating system in very large floppy disks. So you'd basically switch on the computer this huge floppy disk, and that was just to get it to start working. And then if you wanted to use an application or a program, we then had to use a, a smaller floppy disk to do this. Um, and then I remember been amazed that in the I think it was 1998 when the pen drive was introduced and the reason I have this is one of my my screenshots it, it's my first experience really of uh, digital turbulence in my own life in that I had bought a computer which had a zip drive and at the time I thought oh this is great I've got this zip drive it's increasing how much data I can actually store on a floppy on a floppy disk and then less than a year later, USB pens had come in with incredibly more uh, gigabytes of memory that I could store on here and were a lot more convenient to move around. But the reason that I'd wanted the zip drive, which I now when I look back on this, was it was my first year of teaching. And I actually wanted to work at home. I was I just started teaching in London. And it had occurred to me that rather than staying in work and then leaving and then hitting rush hour traffic, as a teacher, it would be nice if I could leave home, avoid the rush hour traffic, and then I didn't mind working a bit later at home if I had to do this. But what I need to bear in mind here is that there was an aim or a purpose to why I had actually made this purchase, but other technology had come along that was going to make or enhance what I was trying to achieve. But I have to be honest, As a this is my first year as teaching, but I didn't grow up wanting to be a teacher. I, I To be honest, I never really had any job aspirations. Um, my accent might not give it away, but I'm from uh, North Birmingham originally. And all I knew was that I wanted to explore more of the world than the part I'd, grow, I'd grown up in. So when I left university, um, I really had no plan of what I wanted to do. And I was a found a member of Generation X. I didn't want to settle down, I knew, into a job for life. And so I undertook project work. I, sp I spent three months here, six months there, uh, mainly as a programmer. But after a while, several friends had become teachers and, and they convinced me it was, a, it was a good fit for me. So I ended up teaching in London, starting off as um, 
uh, just as an IT teacher, then key stage three coordinator, key stage four, then head of department. And I somehow ended up on the um, as a member of the King's College initial training, uh, initial teacher training committee and as a fast track mentor for head teachers. Then after close to 10 years of teaching in a state school in London, I decided to have a complete change of scenery and I, I moved to Barcelona. But before I knew it, 10 years had passed. And I'd moved from a, a role as head of department to assistant head, filling in, as is the way in international schools, various roles along the way, and wearing different hats at different times during the school uh, the school day. Then six years ago, I I joined I I joined Engage uh, after basically introducing and maintaining the system. So a lot of my background comes from this idea of of I've taught in state schools. And I've taught in the independent schools, which is basically in, in the international market. So that that's my my background in there. But you might be wondering why I'm just taking this trip down memory lane. It's really to recognize that technology has always been developing. It's always been adapting society outside of schools. And this is one thing I'd noticed when I first went into schools, how they were encapsulated in a way that meant technology didn't really impact on them too much. Um, and if any of you have seen Carl Fish and Scott McLeod's um, 2008 viral video uh, about exponential times. So in that video, which I'm not going to show now, which I, I sometimes do in a, in, a, in a presentation, they were looking about how quick technology had advanced. And if we have a look here, it took the radio for about 38 years to reach an audience of 50 million. It took Pokemon Go just 19 days. So you can see that disruption has always taken place. Things of developments have always been happening in society, but they're speeding up and it's moving quicker. Jobs for life are, are very few and far between anymore. And many jobs that we're that we we're involved in at the moment didn't exist when we were in education. And that's going to be true for our own students. When we start thinking about education and what we're trying to achieve, we're basically preparing um, many students for jobs that we don't know are going to exist. And I have a, a, one example of this. I have a friend who now works in the advertising industry as a drone director. So he takes a drone, there's a video on the drone, he flies around and he makes videos uh, and directs these videos. So that we would never have dreamt of when we were growing up as, student, uh, as students. Um, and so it does beg the question, how do schools prepare pupils for the future if they don't know what the future is and it's going to arrive so quickly? So the future is unpredictable, but that doesn't mean we can't take educated guesses of what will happen next. One thing we can do is we can keep an eye on what's happening in, tech, in technology and be open minded about where the next the next big thing will be. I mean, what's what's the big thing which is going to hit us next? And often it's where different digital capabilities clash in a specific context. There's, there's, a, there's a reason the Renaissance actually happened in coffee houses. It was where like minded people came together, shared ideas and formulated their eureka moment. It wasn't an, an individual sitting in the bath normally, which creates or, or designs things. It's when we get all this extra information and we bounce ideas off each other and we join things together and we end up producing something which is new. Uh, at a recent, my own example of this is at a recent conference, I heard talk of blockchains, which is something I don't particularly know much about using cryptocurrencies. And that was, and the talk was about using those to validate educational certificates. So that's one thing we might need to be careful of in the future is, okay, are we going to need blockchain technology to validate uh, our educational certificates? And how does that follow with us? throughout our lives. So that's a look at technology has been disturbing society and it's going to continue disturbing um, uh, technology. 
but how has it affected schools, which is the, the reason you'll be here? Now, traditionally, when you look at a school, schools will have the technology separated into three separate but overlapping areas. The, the first part is the infrastructure. So you've probably got somebody in your school at the moment who's looking after the Wi-Fi connections, is looking after the hardware, is fixing printers. So they've, they're giving you access to the network and they're probably also firefighting. They're probably going around and making little fixes. And probably the, the major area of concern would be the photocopying, um, the photocopy and making sure that the photocopy is working. Then the school office will need data services. And that will be things like staff HR, there'll be finance packages, mass communication with parents. But they will be looking after the data services of the actual school. And that will sit on top of the infrastructure because you, there's no point having any software if you can't actually get access to it or your computers are down and you can't use these wonderful programs you have. But then schools also need to be concerned about the actual learning in the classroom. And often technology would have approached into the, to the classroom as content delivery. So the resources have all been made to you. And this may come from virtual learning environments or with things like interactive whiteboards, or you might be using iPads or, and projecting out onto each individual iPads and maybe trying to get some, um, some collaboration taking place. But quite often in schools, as with the interactive whiteboard, they were basically just enhancing or slightly developing a little bit more what was already taking place. The interactive whiteboard was replaced the chalkboard because it had various advantages to it, but it wasn't really revolutionizing anything in the, in the school. It wasn't revolutionizing the way that we teach. Now, one of the drawbacks of, of this kind of system, and, and basically schools can muddle along with this, is that you could end up very easily having different people buying different what they thought quite honestly were best points or uh, solution packages so they were they were buying what they thought was the best for them uh, but unfortunately a few things were going to happen here you were going to end up with these different soft with these different platforms or this uh, different software with data silos so data would just be on one person's uh, system or on one person's desk and it wasn't easily shared the next point would be that you would have overlapping functionality and, and therefore you've got systems which might be redundant. You might be able to get rid of a few systems because the other systems can actually do this. Um, and when you when you can't share data and therefore it ends up in data silos, one other major concern of this is if the data is incorrect or, or is different in different areas of different data silos, how do we know which one's correct? Which is the actual source of truth? So am I actually looking at the most up-to-date information? And that can have various consequences. Uh, a very simple example from my own experience of trying to introduce uh, Engage was we accidentally double booked uh, a, a, a seat in the classroom. So we had a spare gap. Um, a parent, an ex-parent phoned up the school and said, look, can we have, uh, or can our child come back to the school? The head knew there was a gap and said, yeah, of course, come back in. Not realising that in a separate system, and, and this was part of the justif justification for moving towards Engage, that on the um, on the emails that the admissions office had been sending out, that morning she had literally already said that gap was going to be taken up by another student. So we had two students coming in to take up one space, which wasn't the best conversation that we wanted. Having a central system where all that information um, is shared overcame those types of problems. So what's an interesting thing to do here is um, to, have to produce a map of the tasks and the functionality that your software has. And this is probably... Um, best left to someone in the IT department to do this. So one of the one of the things you'll find out from this is 
Are there more products than you need? And, and therefore, are you financially wasting resources? Also, as a notional uh, costing, are staff members repeating tasks and wasting time? Can staff quickly find out the information they require to make informed choices? OK, so what it would also produce for you, and this is I've always found very, very useful in looking at purchasing new software, is that it generated for me a list of generic functions. So I wasn't stuck in the mindset of saying, OK, it has to do it in a particular way. I wasn't stuck in a software. I have a list of functions. If I am buying a new piece of software and I am talking to a salesperson, what I would like to know is how does this platform that you're trying to get me interested in, how does it accomplish these actual functions that I require? As a side effect, it also provided me with the ability to analyze workflow in schools. Now, although there, I could do a separate uh, presentation on data flow diagrams and workflows in, in schools, and this is probably better left to, a, um, to another discussion. I'm a, I'm a big fan of data flow diagrams. And if you're not familiar with data flow diagrams, you basically take somebody um, who's working in the group or a particular cohort, teachers and admin staff, finance staff, parents, potential parents, and you look at the data that they need to receive or the information they need to receive. So they're, a, they're basically a destination of information. And are they a source of any information? So is there information that I require from them? And this is going to flow into my system and out of my system. So what this allowed me to do is to be able to say, right, okay, whatever technological changes are taking place, I need to make sure that this admissions officer is receiving this information, that the uh, parents are receiving this information. And for the admissions officer to make their choices, for example, they're going to need data or information from the potential parents. So when I'm designing my system, I can then flow back and say, right, OK, in order for this uh, admissions officer to do their job, and to be informed, I require this information. My system, and this is the bit that you leave to the uh, to the platform that you've purchased or you leave it to your IT department, is how is it processed so it appears in a format that I can understand? Because as SL, as senior leadership, we don't really want to see um, all the actual facts and figures. We want to have a dashboard. So we want to very quickly be able to see a dashboard. And one of the things a lot of systems will be now moving towards, and especially we are moving towards this, is dynamic dashboards, which basically give you up-to-date information. But in order to create those dashboards, I need information, and I need to know where that information is coming from. And I need to make sure, therefore, that I that, that data, when it comes into the system, my system enables that to happen and can actually get this information from its sources so then it appears at the destination. Now, this is therefore very difficult to do if you have ad hoc systems which have been introduced, as I mentioned previously, creating data silos. Uh, so what we would like to, what would be best practice is if not one system which is dealing with everything for you, it's the ability for these different systems to talk, so therefore you can pull it out without having to access or go into different systems and spend your time collating reports together. So while schools, uh, while this would all make schools efficient, there was never really a compelling argument to do it. As schools could just basically model on or muddle on as, as they were in a kind of uh, better the devil you know approach. Or as uh, one admissions officer once told me, um, <laughs> John, I'm, I'm too busy to have to, to spare any time to find out how I can introduce a more efficient system. OK, but then that, that leaves us to now. Um, because I, as I, I just mentioned, schools were, if they chose to, could ignore technological advances. They, they could basically encapsulate themselves and say, look, we're going to carry on as is, as we always have done. 
Uh, no mobile phones, let's ban them. No social media, why are we going to get involved with that? It's just trouble. Now, we could argue it's our role as um, preparing students for their future, that these are things that we should be interested in exploring and explaining and teaching how uh, students would use these tools and um, be involved in social media uh, in a way which supports them. They could just, schools could very easily just say, look, here's a textbook, turn to page, whatever. Uh, here's a table, sit down, face the board, listen to me. I'm, I'm the sage on the stage. You basically need to listen to what I'm saying. And at the end, I, I'm going to test whether you've understood what I've said by asking you questions. And I don't want to write them on the board. So have a look at the end of chapter questions. But then 2020 happened and the school bubble was burst and forcing the majority of, of teachers outside of their comfort zones. And students, teachers and parents had to adapt quickly with the pandemic. Suddenly we weren't allowed to be in schools. Our normal way of life, normal way of teaching uh, had disappeared. And teachers tended to then end up in broadly um, one of three groups. They either thrived with the, um, the technology. They liked it. They're like, this is great. This is helping me to do stuff. Then you had those that basically held on and were like, well, right, I'm going to survive. I will get through this until um, until we're back in, in schools. And then we also had those that just gave up. It was like, no, I, I just can't cope with this. This is just uh, it's a bridge too far for me. Now, thankfully, the majority were in stages one and two. And the surprising thing for me was that in general, people were surprised that teachers coped well, that teachers put on a, a great effort to cope with uh, this new pandemic teaching style we had to introduce. But for me, as a profession, teachers are incredibly well prepared for change. Students come and go. Teachers come and go from your department. Senior leaders come and go. And as is traditional, when a new head teacher comes in, you'll often find there's a change to the uniform and a, and a change to the, to the school timetable and the school day. The government announces strategies, not necessarily, um, have I said in the past, that I can see the benefits of these strategies. And exam boards modify their specifications. Um, and also, if anyone who's ever taught a class can understand how very quickly uh, the principle of, of, uh, the, of chaos theory, where a small action can have a unintended consequences and can just escalate into something a lot bigger. And that can be from as trivial as wearing a new tie, uh, which can lead to unintended consequences as the, the students get excited by the fact that you've decided to change your, your tie. Um, so, so there it is. We, we have the pandemics arrived and we've had to cope with it. Now, as I said, it, it, to me, it was never surprising that teachers could cope with change. Um, and it pretty much follows the uh, diffusion of innovation theory, which was developed in the, the, the 1960s by um, E. E. M. Rogers. Um, and that was introduced to explain how a product gains momentum and, and spreads through um, a particular um, population. And this is basically a theory that even if you're not aware of the name of it, uh, if you've tried to introduce a new product or even a new service to a school or a new way of doing anything in a school, will well understand. You're going to have those that are excited by the introduction of something new. Okay. Then you'll have the majority who are going to follow and see whether this is best practice and is it beneficial to them? How, how much do they really need to do this? Is it a fad? Is it going to disappear soon? So they will wait. But if it's a sensible product, if it's a sensible service, they will move with it. And then eventually you'll have, um, in here I've got the, the laggards, those that are going to stay behind and resist any change and try and keep on to, to, to what they're currently doing. And so when you do introduce or we have change, what we need to manage really is the two ends. Those that are innovators, that they don't jump too far ahead. 
and how do we get the laggards to actually be using the system so they're not causing a, a detrimental um, effect on the system? Okay, so in my opinion, teachers thrived through the pandemic and and, uh, and teaching from home, and despite all the inconveniences that that really did bring. And I'm uh, talking to myself as an as an ex teacher, my wife is still teaching, and my two children were um, are in school, and to, to have all four of us trying to actually do Zoom meetings or to work online was a was a challenge. Uh, so where did they these teachers um where, where did we thrive and survive well according to to ed week they, they carried out a survey and it's no surprising that using video conferencing tools and the use of video and multimedia in general and setting up pupils to work away and continue on the on the things on their own without direct uh, supervision um uh, were one of the one of the key advancements that that took place. Now, anecdotally, uh, there was another benefit for homeschooling, and that really was the appreciation of teachers about the amount of effort, the amount of dedication that teachers actually put in to the the students to make sure that the students actually do develop and and do prosper in the future. So to, I'm going to give myself a, a bit of a breathing space in the moment. Uh, but what I would really like you to do is to think about all the changes that happened over the last two years. And what would be some of the things that you would like to keep? And it would be great if you could uh, write those into the, into the chat. Um, for me as a parent, and especially a parent now that, that does a lot of traveling, and I spend a lot of time in airports and hotel uh, hotels and, and, like I said, traveling in general. It was the parent teacher meetings taking place online. I was already getting emails. That wasn't so much of a problem. I mean, I, I, I'd like to have a bit more uh, information about how my, my children are, are progressing. But really, the, the one thing that I found extremely useful, and I wish this had taken place before the pandemic, was that I could was able to do Zoom meetings. Um, not I keep saying Zoom. No, there are other kinds of video conferencing systems available to you, um, but that's what I found the most most beneficial. So yeah, so have a quick think. What would you like to keep? Um, and by keep, I mean once we go back into the, a physical teaching environment again. So all the things we've been doing remotely what was the what were the good things what were the things that actually that worked well for me and i'd like to keep that now in a moment on this section I'm, I'm going to move on to agile leadership but i just want to spend a moment to recap on what i've said so far so there's basically three points i've been trying to make so the first one is digital progress and therefore disruption is nothing new but it is speeding up uh, sim simply put, we are preparing students for a rapidly changing, unknown future. The, the pace of technology means you cannot be an expert for very long, and we all have to prepare for the unpredictable. My second point was that schools ended up quite often with systems that were ad hoc, that created data silos, that wasn't really a joined up thinking. That's not true for every school, but often that's what happened. And then my third point, which is very, very important, is that teachers, parents and pupils can use technology. I've often heard that as an excuse from head teachers that I'm talking to is that our parents won't understand this. Our parents won't use it. And quite often in the back of my head, I have a little voice saying what you're saying, you're projecting. What you're saying is I don't really get what's happening with this and it's getting me out of my comfort zone. Uh, what you'll find with the pandemic is that teachers, parents and pupils could all step out of their comfort zone and you'll be surprised at how much technology that they could cope with. So I'll pause for a moment. Uh, 
mainly so I can get my, my own breath back slightly. And even if you just take a moment and don't write it in the chat, although it'd be much appreciated if you did write it in the chat, what would you like to keep? So, agile leadership. So I've had a look at saying, okay, there's going to be disruption that cannot be avoided. Fine. So how do we cope? So how do especially senior leaders cope with this disruption? Well, my recommendation is to move towards agile leadership. Now, I don't want to plunge this uh, presentation into a techie wormhole, but I think it's important to understand the background of agile management techniques before exploring them in schools. So it started out as a method to speed up software development. And this is where it comes from my own uh, computer science, uh, electrical engineering background. But it can be used wherever speed counts. And you need in agility in meeting the needs of customers, where, where this is basically crucial. And basically in, in 2001, 17 uh, um, software developers published a manifesto. Now, this manifesto they published, why did they go out of their way, way to do this? Well, consider the, the London Black Cab. So in the days before Google Maps, the most efficient way to, to find a building location in London, as, as I well know from, from living in London for 10 years, uh, was to jump into the back of a into the back of a black cab. The, the taxi drivers knew their way around the city, uh, basically with every street. Now, for those of you who've ever been in London, there's no grid system. I, I now live in Barcelona, which has a lovely grid system. If you go to New York, it has a lovely grid system. You you make an error, you just basically you can basically do, can always get back to where you want to go. But that's not the same in London every pathway can end up in a completely different area and you really need to know where you're, you're going. So it's so complicated, the roads in, in um, London, that it, this wasn't a skill that you could learn overnight and taxi drivers had to pass something called the knowledge. And they could often take several years of study and practice to pass this test. And on average, it took uh, 12 attempts for a taxi driver to pass the test and this is a was a very big thing and it, it, it was a, a badge of honor for a taxi driver that they they had done the knowledge but then in 2015 uh, a well-known uh, cabbie school or uh, that teaches the knowledge called knowledge point shut its doors it closed down this gps and Uber had changed the game. They had disrupted the market. Now, in order to cope with this rapid or quick level of disruption, the manifesto was simply a set of values and principles to overcome the weakness of the traditional hierarchical pyramid management structure. Now, in a school setting, we simply change uh, value two to, to rather than saying working software to lessons that work. And we change customers to mean parents, students, but also staff. Now, that's very important to senior leaders that we also include our own staff in this, that they are that they are people we need to collaborate with, not to necessarily dictate to, although this isn't an exact science. There were also 12 principles to uh, agile management. But on the, the, the screen here, I've, I've only mentioned the ones which are relevant to schools. So we need to build a culture where change is welcome. We need to cooperate. That's clear. So we need to have the ability to to, to be able to communicate our, our ideas effectively. And, and this is a difficult skill in itself, but management 
has to give the people around them the the security that they are allowed to say their opinions so there is that freedom to express yourself so and that individuals are motivated and trusted that we encourage face-to-face -face communication like i was just mentioned that uh, we don't want people living in fear and we need to keep things simple that there's nothing worse as teachers you all know where work is generated to justify somebody's role so we thought oh this would be great I'm, i've got a career progression for myself and in order for me to progress i am going to basically give all the people work to do and the final thing is that we need to undertake self-review often uh but we need to regularly undertake self-review i was about to say often but i don't really mean that what i mean is it needs to be set up at a, a convenient time so but we do need to be doing self-review so what we're looking to do by introducing these values and principles is we're trying to move away from the start of leadership, which was a top down hierarchy to an organization that enables all staff to be proactive problem solvers, to, to think for themselves and to communicate solutions across the organization. We're trying to improve the basically the, the collective intelligence of our of our schools. Also, for staff, it, in a phrase, you'll find that they will go the extra mile because they are more involved in what's happening rather than being dictated to. Now, a lot of schools will have that traditional top-down hierarchy pyramid, but it hinders uh, vigilance as leaders because quite often as a leader, you'll find yourself looking down and making sure that people are following the rules and the regulations than looking out about what's happening and about the opportunities and threats there are to your school. So quite often when any organization's leadership are surprised by an event, so something happens uh, that surprises them, there is often someone lower than the pyramid who actually knew or saw this coming. It just that information never flowed to the leadership. It reminds me uh, quite often of Blockbuster. I mean, Blockbuster at one stage was huge. I mean, they had they captured the market on renting out videos, but they didn't react. And as you now know, they don't exist. They they weren't able to react to streaming. So streaming came along, and now Blockbuster are obsolete. There would have been surely people in that organization who could see what was happening in the stream, streaming environment. But for whatever reason, it never got to the management or the management ignored it, but they weren't able to cope. If I go back a little bit further in time to uh, for my own uh, memories, the, the um, zero photocopiers created the, the graphical user interface for computers and they also invented the mouse but they just couldn't see the potential of it. And they ended up, in essence, giving it to Steve Jobs at Apple. And now we all know what Steve Jobs at Apple was then later on able to produce. Um, but in order for us to adapt these values and principles and to move away from uh, the leadership pyramid, it is worth remembering or keeping in the back of our mind, uh, the management saying that culture each break each strategy for breakfast um i mean that's not to say that strategy isn't important it's just that an empowering culture is a clearer route to organizational uh, success uh, where individuals take responsibility for results and, and moving you away from uh, bureaucratic silos where formulaic approaches uh, dominate how people actually work and so I, I, my, my five points that I take away from this, from our job, is that we need to welcome change. We need to be conscious of data flow when creating procedures. So, and these procedures could be the introdu introduction of, um, of software or technology. So if I'm doing this, where's data coming from? Where's it going to? Is this, this new system I'm introducing is it going to produce the information which is required and can it collect the information which is required 
and to build teams to move away from this hierarchical structure. Now, these teams can be small teams that don't always exist forever. Um, and to set generic goals, to remove technology from the question. So if you start thinking about what you're trying to achieve, as I said before, you would um, take tech, basically technology out of the question. Then you need to trust your teams and keep them motivated. And you need to stay informed, hence the, the communication part. You then need to undertake self-review and you have to be willing to step outside of your comfort zone uh, to keep your curiosity. So finally, I, I want to bring that agile leadership back to technology and, and have a quick look at digital uh, transformation. Um, I mean, this is a broad catch-all term, which would basically cover any initiative involving uh, digital technology. And it will quite clearly um, change from organization to organization or from, or from school to school. Okay, so here are basically some trends I, I would be looking out for. And what I would like you to do is to think about for each of these points, are there possible opportunities for your schools here? Or are, they, or are there opportunities, but also do they pose a threat to the school? Is there something here which could impact on the way that you're trying to teach? Now, can your current management structure cope with acting on these developments? So and I'll very briefly just go over what the, these things are in case you're not aware. So the Internet of Things. So basically, we're connecting devices up to the uh, to the internet so you can access them remotely washing machines refrigerators in your home for example can be controlled uh, via the internet so augmented reality now this is basically the idea that you, you could for example on your phone or a camera you put that over a particular area and it enhances and basically create things on your phone while you're still looking at reality. Uh, one of the first examples of this was, I think it was on the uh, the New York subway, where you could put your phone over a, a chair and then it would explain, um, I know it, an, a, an alligator came out for some reason, but it would also be able to explain a little bit of the history visually on your phone about that area. And it actually superimposed it onto the image you were seeing. Uh, cybersecurity, I think this is definitely comes under the, the, the threat heading here, but we're, we're all going to have to be aware about are we protecting the data that we have about students? And I think that's vital and probably goes without saying. But we've also got increased personalised learning as well taking place. So the use of technology to do that, which harks back to a long time ago where personalised learning but it was too difficult to introduce on pen and paper. Uh, but can we use technology to do that? And then my fifth one, which is something I'm, I'm particularly keen on, uh, is artificial intelligence and big data. I, in my head, I start to think about something like Jarvis from Iron Man and the, uh, the Marvel movies. And that Could it be possible in the future that teachers will have their own personal assistant, someone that it doing a lot of the marking for them and also analyzing that big data to show them maybe even kind of like a heat map of, okay, this is where the cohorts weaknesses are. And therefore have you thought about doing this lesson plans and then being able to search the entire internet for, uh, to share best practice from other teachers and other educators to say, look, this is what, um, has worked in other schools and isn't this a great lesson plan and isn't this a great thing that you could do uh, with your schools so there's quite a few things in technology which are on the horizon and could all mingle together uh, okay now i will end with, with my good teaching hat on my, my plenary um and really what, what I would say here is that there are, there are really there are three things to take away from, from today's presentation. 
Uh, one is that change will happen. We, we can't avoid that. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Two, people are resilient and will adapt. We shouldn't be so scared that this change is taking place. And thirdly, agile leadership is required in order to adapt to these changes. Okay, so really there's a chance to ask questions um, or, or to write questions into the chat. Otherwise, I would like to say thank you for attending this presentation. Thank you, Jonathan. We'll just give it a few moments to see if there are any questions for you. Um, are you happy for us to share your details for anyone that is watching this as a recording? Yes, of course. Lovely. Okay, so I think what we'll do is we will wrap it up here. Once again, Jonathan, thank you on behalf of the entire BSME team for your session today. And um, thanks to everyone who joined in as well. Um, as mentioned, the session is recorded and I will send you a link afterwards to watch it back. If you do want to sign up for our future webinars, please do so on bsme.org.uk. Once again, thank you and please enjoy the rest of your day.